Did you find the launch of the Falcon Heavy yesterday to be just super exciting and actually a bit inspirational? Or did you just look at it as if, well, it's just something else getting shot up into space? I don't know. I can't tell you. All I can tell you for certain is the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. It is Wednesday, February 7th, 2018. I am Jeff McAleer. I'm your host here at The Daily Dope, as well as the Grand Poobah of thegaminggang.com. It's Wednesday, so that means it is War Game Wednesday, and I've got a double dip of GMT goodness ahead. So I will talk about that in just a moment, but I do want to mention that I did find the SpaceX launch of the Falcon Heavy to be really, really cool yesterday. And I, I love the fact that they've got the Tesla Roadster floating around the Earth now <laughs> in orbit, and it's playing David Bowie on a loop. It had a really fun nod to Douglas Adams and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with Don't Panic right on the front. And I'm wondering how many people out there were thinking about the movie Heavy Metal, the 80s animated film Heavy Metal, when they saw the car orbiting the planet. Because there's that scene where I, I think it's a Mustang, if I remember right, comes plummeting down <laughs> right into the Earth's atmosphere and shoots pop open. It was really wild. The, that was the first thing that popped into my head when I saw that car circling the Earth. Also, I did kind of think to myself, wow, how far NASA has fallen and how back when I was a kid, the whole idea of exploring space and going to other planets was a big deal and we would see all this live footage of things like uh, like the U.S. and the Soviets, uh, their capsules coming together and yeah, all that kind of stuff. And it was like, wow. And these days it's sort of like, meh, whatever. Let's have some private company take care of our, our space uh, agency. I don't know. Anyway, so welcome aboard. If this is the first time tuning in, I'm pretty chatty. Just point that out right away. And I do want to take a moment to say thank you to all the war gamers out there who tune in 
both live as well as uh, catch the videos after they're uh, rendered up on YouTube. I really appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate anybody tuning in or watching the vids. Don't get me wrong. But the war gamers out there really have made the Wednesday shows two, three, four times as popular as just the standard when I do family games or role playing games and things like that. So I really, really do appreciate it. I kind of get the feeling that some of you out there kind of spreading the word to your fellow grognards to possibly check out the Daily Dope as well as the gaming gang. And uh, eh, from my heart, I'm really saying thank you very, very much. The other videos, I don't, you know, it's not bad. It's not terrible. Uh, I don't expect like tons and tons of people checking out the channel. I don't know. It's been been there for, uh, I don't know, six years. But uh, I don't know if it's, you know, some of the family games are expecting some cute, perky girl to be talking about, <laughs> you know, family games. And you know, they take a peek and it's like, hey, who's this mug? What's going on here? What the heck? Anywho, on today's show, I am going to be showing off what you can get in the Wing Leader Expansion Blitz 1939 to 1942 from my pals over at GMT Games. It is an expansion. You do need to have one of the core Wing Leader games in order to utilize it. And once we take a peek at this, I am going to tell you how you can win it because there's a contest going on right now to score this very copy. I will actually tape the bottom of the bag that seems to have torn before I send it out. So I've got that. Now that's not going to take up a whole lot of time today. So what I wanted to do, and I've wanted to do this for quite some time, is I'm going to do a how to play of one of my favorite games of all time, Twilight Struggle. That's right. It, as I mentioned, it is a double dip of GMT game goodness today. I'm going to show you how to play Twilight Struggle. I'm also going to talk about uh, some basic strategies that each side may want to utilize. Kind of make it a little easier. One of the reasons why I, I and of course, it's just the box. <laughs> because the game's set up. It's just the box top, really, that I'm holding up here. And uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do a how to play of Twilight Struggle is uh, people see the game and the first thing, and I know it's War Game Wednesday too, you know, so I guess maybe I'm not helping <laughs> with, with this preconception that people have when they see what Twilight Struggle looks like set up is right away they think, oh, it's a war game. Oh, no, yeah, it's not for me. <laughs> Trust me, it's for just about everybody. Anyway, I do have some news today, so I'm going to jump into that. And uh, strangely enough, it's kind of miniature centric today for some odd reason. There was one news piece about a very, very family friendly game that I'm going to save till tomorrow because it just seemed odd for me to squeeze it in because it is really for us well, for the whole family, all ages. But I mean, it's got a lot of appeal for smaller kids, too. So I will have that on tomorrow's show. All right. So Renegade Game Studios is at it again. They're always doing something. Every time you turn around, they've got some new game coming. And yes, they have a new title coming in May. It's a two-player game called Prowler's Passage. Unfortunately, I only have a single image to share with you. But I do have the dope from Renegade. In the heart of the sleeping city lies incredible wealth. While the gates to the city are well guarded, no one is watching what's under their feet. The dead of night provides just enough cover for you to tunnel toward untold riches to plunder the city from within. Act quickly, as a rival thief has the same plan. Oh, oh. In Prowler's Passage, you and a competing thief will burrow into the city through a network of underground passages to grab valuable items while attempting to gain control of key districts. Steal the best items, create the longest tunnels, and control districts to become the premier Prowler. It features a 
an aspect where you're going to build a network of underground passages to plunder the city. You'll control districts to increase your reach. And you'll also plunder valuables and complete achievements to gain the most wealth. The game is for two thieves, ages 12 and up. We'll play it about 30 minutes. And of course, as I mentioned, it's two players. It is going to arrive in May. Uh, I forgot off the top of my head what date. <laughs> Sorry. But it will carry an MSRP of $35. As I said, boy, uh, Renegade Games is Renegade Game Studios, I should say, always has a lot of things going on. Every time you turn around, there's a new game coming from Renegade, and uh, I haven't played a ton of them. They're not necessarily an easy company to get review copies from, but the Renegade games I have played, I've enjoyed them quite a lot. Really, really dig Clank. A deck building adventure, but I've only played the first one. Haven't played any expansions or a clank in space. I did forget, I should always point this out at the beginning of the show. I don't know why it always just completely pops out of my head. There is chat available. So if uh, when I'm doing the unboxing or if I'm talking about Twilight Struggle or if you just want to say hello. By all means, just uh, simply jump in. Chat is available on Twitch as well as YouTube. And for some strange reason, I always, after I say Twitch, I always want to say Twitter. But no, chat's not available on Twitter. <laughs> it's only on Twitch and YouTube. All right, so miniatures gamers are going to want to take note of my next two items. And first off, the second edition of Wreck Age. Get it? Wreckage. From Chicago area Hyacinth Games, hello neighbors, is now available. That's right. And it looks actually very interesting. The second edition is available in PDF, and the post-apocalyptic game originally appeared as an RPG slash minis hybrid, but it looks as if Hyacinth has gone full skirmish mode in this new edition, and I have the dope. Welcome to the Resurgence. Welcome to the Wreck Age. Wreck Age is a dystopian post-Exodus adventure game where struggling communities vie for resources on a post-collapse Earth. In the 23rd century, the Earth verged on total annihilation. Rapid climate shifts caused by centuries of industrial pollution and nuclear waste had brought the planet to the brink of an ecological meltdown. I hate when that happens. Countless reparative efforts had failed. Each solution was too little and far too late. Left with no alternative, world leaders collaborated on a last-ditch effort to save humankind. The Exodus. See ya. It was a bold plan involving several waves of evacuations with the end goal of colonizing new planets. The Exodus promised survival for everyone. It was an escape from a decaying planet. It was hope. It was a lie. The brilliant, the rich, and the powerful gathered their families, their valuables, and their resources for the first wave. They left Earth in a flotilla of arcs, scientific vessels, and seed ships. Within a few days, however, it became clear that there would be no second wave. Hope mutated into rage as the ill-fated masses realized that they had been left behind to rot. Governments fell apart and economies crumbled. The world collapsed into anarchy. Anarchy, I say! As society collapsed, so too did the Earth itself. The oceans rose, natural disasters ravaged the coasts, and chemical rain scorched the arable land. Countless species vanished, either slaughtered outright or dying in mass, unable to adapt to the perilous new environment. As catastrophes crashed down one after another in a crescendo of failure, humanity itself came dangerously close to extinction. Ah, extinction. Extinction? That's not a word, Jeff. Mm. Since the exodus, uncounted generations have eked out a harrowing, threadbare existence with what little remained. 
Now a new world is emerging from the ashes. Every storm eventually passes. Every desolate winter eventually melts into a fragile spring. Yet the scars of suffering and chaos remain. Recovery will be slow and painful. Few grand cities remain and even fewer great leaders. There is no centralized structure. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Little... Ah, gotta grab a sip here. Hold on one sec. The powerful fight over the scraps of the old world while the weak struggle just to make it through another day. Currently, you can snag the 132-page PDF of Wreck Age from DriveThruRPG for $12.50. And if you thought that that was a very, very long bit of information I shared with you, trust me, go to DriveThruRPG. There is tons of info in the product description. I don't think off the top of my head, I have seen another page for a product that had so much in it. This really does look like a very interesting miniature setting. And as I opened up the news piece, I believe the first edition of Wreckage was uh, kind of a hybrid of role-playing game and miniature skirmish game. And I think some folks were kind of like, well, it should be one or the other. And it looks like that uh, this new edition is strictly a skirmish game. It is a miniature setting. And honestly, that was probably the right move for Hyacinth Games because think about it, the post-apocalyptic setting has a ton of different RPGs out there tackling them already. Whereas maybe not so much with the um, post-apocalyptic miniatures games. Granted, yes, they're out there. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is the only one. But this does look pretty impressive, and I have heard some pretty good things about it. All right, moving right along, I've got a double dip of Modifius Entertainment slash Octung Cthulhu news to bring to you. Plus, and it's going to be a lot, lot of stuff that I'm going to end up reading, too. So I must prepare. So first off, let's talk about the Octung Cthulhu Tactics digital game. That's right. In the Octung Cthulhu universe, a band of allied heroes fight the secret war against the Nazi Black Sun and their rivals, the Nachtwolf. The Nazi factions have turned to the ancient and terrible powers of the mythos, weaponizing evil to win the war. This move has started to yield results as, powered with ancient secrets and terrible mythos allies, Black Sun and Nacht Wolf are on the verge of unleashing terrible weapons upon the allied forces. It is your job to stop them by any means necessary. In the spirit of allied cooperation, Arek Digital has teamed with the creators of Octon Cthulhu, which obviously is Modifius, Modifius, I always can never remember exactly how it's pronounced, so I, I just say Modifius. Mm -hmm. And indie publisher Ripstone to bring this award-winning tabletop RPG to a computer screen near you. Ripstone have been amazingly supportive and are funding the single-player game for release in the fourth quarter of this year. However, there's much more we want to add to the game. We want you to join us in the next phase of the Secret War in raising some extra war bonds to make Octung Cthulhu even more amazing. Over the last five years, since the original Octung Cthulhu RPG smashed its goals on Kickstarter, the team at Modifius have created lots and lots of great characters for the setting. For us to add them all takes a lot more time and resources. For each unit, our team needs to make a set of boned 3D meshes, new animations, and more. We've got the core sorted and locked down, but we really need the Pathfinder Demon Hunters to enter the fray. These elite spiritual Native American warriors bring a mixture of ancient knowledge and modern-day firepower into the fight that the allied heroes desperately need. 
With your support, we'll be able to get these amazing warriors created digitally and into the game. Your backing may also allow you to get behind the scenes views on the development of the game, to chat with the development team and offer your thoughts, and grab some great original Octoon Cthulhu merchandise and much more. Do you want to mention that there is a video for the Kickstarter that I've got? And it doesn't violate any copyright on YouTube. I already checked. So let's take a peek at the video. It is about five and a half minutes long, just so you know. The Nazis, the villains of World War II, crushing the free spirit of Europe under their evil jackboot. They were obsessed with occult knowledge. But what if their secret missions to ancient sites found more than just broken pottery? Because there was something out in the darkness, waiting. And when the Nazis called, it answered. As the Second World War rages over land, sea, and air, so too it is fought in the shadows. This is the secret war, and it is fought for a greater price than the fate of nations, the fate of humanity itself. A war of frightening inhuman conspiracies from the depths of time. Secrets from within hidden Nazi bases Unbelievable war machines, the products of Nazi scientific power. Become part of the stories of amazing heroism, struggling to stop this nightmare alliance of science and the occult. This is Achtung Cthulhu, a band of allied heroes fight the secret war against the Nazi Black Sun and their rivals, the Nachtwulfe, or Night Wolf. Both are on the verge of unleashing their terrible weapons upon the unsuspecting allied forces. I'm going to answer a few questions from the community today. And... I'm Chris Birch, the creator of Acton Cthulhu and founder of the tabletop games company Modifius. When we launched on Kickstarter five years ago, I had no idea how much it would catch people's imagination. Since then, it has expanded and evolved from a multi award winning role playing game to board games, miniatures, audio adventures and more. I'm happy to talk in more detail about some of those with other people. Hello, I'm Thomas Rawlings. I was the designer of the multiple award winning Call of Cthulhu The Wasted Land and longtime Lovecraftian nerd. I recently used a great race of Yith mind control device to bring together Auroc Digital, that's our game development studio, Modifius and the good people of indie publisher Ripstone. Together we hatched a plan to create a video game of Achtung Cthulhu. Which is why we're talking to you. Ripstone have been amazingly supportive and are funding the video game. But there's so much more we would like to add to this. So we asked if they wouldn't dash mind if we appealed to the good people of Kickstarter for some extra war bonds to make Acton Cthulhu even more amazing. And we know it will be. So here's the classified briefing on the project. Together, the team is creating a turn-based strategy game with amazing visuals, quality production values, and that draws from the Achtung Cthulhu role-playing game universe. In this game, the player will control a tough band of heroes trapped behind enemy lines, trying to uncover and foil a Nazi plot of terrifying evil using their wits and a lot of ammo. We'll be revealing more about the game over the coming months and a lot more to our backers. There are a lot of great characters in the Acton Cthulhu setting. For Thomas and his team to add them all takes a lot of time and resources. For a new character, we need to do quite a bit of extra. Roughly, we need to create multiple meshes, create a bunch of textures, rig the meshes to the animation bones, ready for the animation data. Then, of course, we need to create the animations themselves. However, the odds are against our heroes, and they really need the Pathfinder Demon Hunters to enter the fray. These elite spiritual warriors bring a mixture of ancient knowledge and firepower the heroes desperately need. With your support, we'll be able to get these amazing warriors created digitally and into the game. In Achtung Thulu, 
The deck is stacked against the side of light, so your support is key in evening the odds against the forces of evil and helping to make this one of the best strategy games ever. There are a host of unique features, as well as the Achtung Cthulhu setting for the game. What, you might ask? Well, this new game takes the light and darkness of good and evil and weaves them into the fabric of strategic gameplay. Being created right now, is a powerful system where the momentum of your actions opens new lines of tactical attack. Combined, this allows a skilled commander to plan the actions of your team to create ingenious combinations of tactical brilliance rivaling General Patton or Monty. Your support allows the team to build on these and add in more original content. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, so I have to say that this is a pretty wild Kickstarter because the PC game is already funded and it's slated for a September 2018 release as far as I understand that might not be 100% correct because of course you know once again we're talking about a PC game and delays happen quite often so really this Kickstarter is to add additional units to the game so when you take a look at the Kickstarter goal you'll notice the Kickstarter goal is pretty low but this is what I find interesting about this Kickstarter is you can get the Octan Cthulhu RPG PDFs included in the various pledge levels. So I'll give you a great example. So at the $28 pledge level, you'll get a copy of the video game as well as PDFs of the Octan Cthulhu Investigator's Guide and the Keeper Guide free. That's a really good deal because the way you look at it is if you don't already have the core, two core books for Octan Cthulhu, you're getting them free with the video game or kind of vice versa. I, it's, you know, it's, I said it's kind of an odd Kickstarter, but one that was, you know, worthy of a mention because, uh, yeah. Octan Cthulhu's really, really popular. And I should mention, to celebrate the Octan Cthulhu Tactics video game, now you can score the core rules of the Octan Cthulhu Skirmish Miniatures game absolutely free. I do believe it's for a limited time, though. Not sure, but I think so. But here's the dope. To celebrate the recent launch of the Octan Cthulhu Tactics video game on Kickstarter, we've decided to make Octan Cthulhu Skirmish War Game free to everyone. Head on over to Kickstarter and search for Octan Cthulhu Tactics to bring the secret wars to your PC and unlock rewards, bonus heroes, and a whole wealth of Octan Cthulhu Tactics goodies. Set around the events of the Secret War, Octan Cthulhu Skirmish introduces players to the terrifying conflict fought to stop the sorceress Nazi cult of the Black Sun from unleashing a tide of mythos horrors against the Allies. Yes, just like in the video game. Take command of brave allied forces like Badger's Commandos and the Pathfinder Demon Hunters alongside historical army units and lead them to victory against the Axis hordes. Deploy special hero units like Sergeant Brandon Carter, Professor Richard Dedman, or Arian Dubois to take on the might of the Nazi war machine. As the Axis, strike terror into your opponents by commanding the sorceress Black Sun and her mythos allies, bringing new levels of fear onto the battlefield. Call on the terrifying Deep One War Party or let the unholy servitors of Nair Lothotep Supplement your forces and crush the allied threat. Octan Cthulhu Skirmish is powered by Spartan Games' Dystopian Legions 2.0 rules set. Rewritten by Matthew Hope, Relic Knights, 
AEW 2 Wrath of Kings, Sedition Wars. Yes, you've heard of Matthew. And Nick Fallon, as well as John Houlihan. The game allows for fast-playing battles from small skirmishes up to full-scale conflicts. Modiphius has added new rules for Mythos powers, creatures, artifacts, and spells to allow players to experience the full flavor and terror of the Octung Cthulhu universe with their heroes and troops. The range is designed to work alongside other popular 22mm miniature lines. As I previously mentioned, you can score Octon Cthulhu Skirmish absolutely free over at Drive Through RPG. And I do want to point out, because I was talking about Wreckage as well as the free Octon Cthulhu Skirmish, if you happen to pop on over to thegaminggang.com and click on one of our Drive Through banners. If you end up purchasing anything, and you don't have to, of course, if you're going there for a freebie like Octon Cthulhu Skirmish, but if you do, we get a small portion of that sale. So, and that uh, actually goes a long way to uh, keeping me around, as well as providing me an opportunity to review other role-playing games. Alrighty, so that is the news for today. Now, one th I do want to mention something about Octon Cthulhu. And it's it's cool, it's a cool system, and I, I don't have really anything against anybody who plays Octon Cthulhu, but for me, as far as World War II mythos role-playing, I gotta be honest, World War Cthulhu was, was more up my alley uh, from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. Now, unfortunately, because the license with Chaosium and Cubicle 7 expired, all of their Call of Cthulhu supplements are no longer available. So anyway, so yes, uh, the one thing about Octon Cthulhu to me is uh, it, it uses the mythos more as a crutch for the Nazis than World War Cthulhu did. World War Cthulhu, you know, was not making any excuses for the horrors that the Third Reich perpetrated on many, many human beings. It was not, oh, well, the devil made me do it, and they are Lothotep made me do it. No, absolutely not. Whereas some of the stuff I've seen with Octon Cthulhu, like I said, mm, a little bit of a crutch. Anyway, like I said, I'm not knocking it, but uh, I did I did want to share those uh, the Kickstarter and, of course, the free skirmish rules. Always on, you know, always keeping my eyes peeled on stuff, for stuff, I should say, that you can score on sale or uh, absolutely free. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I am going to take a look at Wing Leader Blitz. So let's uh, switch on over to the other camera real quickly. And if you are not familiar with Wing Leader, Wing Leader is a war game. It's a World War II uh, aerial combat game, but it's not just individual fighters, bombers, things like that. So, for an example, I really, really love the reprint of Wild Blue Yonder that GMT Games did. But, of course, you're looking at each player's really controlling a fighter and wingman. Yeah, maybe two fighters, two wingmen. But you're not controlling whole squadrons as a, as a single player. Whereas with Wing Leader, you're looking at multiple squadrons, multiple wings. So this is going to include uh, 16 new aircraft, 10 new scenarios, a campaign system. Then it's going to talk about all the different battles uh, that are included as well. And it says, please note, Wing Leader Blitz is not a standalone game. You will need to own Wing Leader victories in order to play. Oh, huh. And here I thought uh, you could have, um, isn't it Supremacy in the Air is the latest Wing Leader title? I think that's the title of it. Huh, interesting. Uh, I thought Wing Leader Victories is out of print. I don't know. So let's find out. Let's take a look. All right, so uh, I will point out 
that uh, usually you'll see a different background here, but um, I have Twilight Struggle set up underneath this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's take a look here at the rules, and I'm guessing the scenarios are all in here too. I will point out that there was a bit of a delay in this coming out uh, for many, many people. I, I don't mean many, many people. I mean many people because there was an issue, I believe, with one of the maps that's included with this was not correlated in this package when it was getting shipped out. So I know GMT caught that and some of these had already shipped. So that has been taken care of. So if you are interested in picking up Wing Leader Blitz and you did run across the uh, the news that there was a bit of an issue with one of the maps not being in it, that has been addressed. Okay, so we're going to take a peek through. It's going to talk about campaign setup, summary with the sequ sequence of events, targeting step, sortie generation step, fighter sorties, Bomber sorties, German planning, there's the planning step, scenario types, splitting fighter squadrons, defender order of battle. Wow, there's a, a lot of rules in here that uh, I thought, you know, this was just expanding it with some scenarios and a campaign system, but looks like there's quite a lot going on. Setting up for an intercept scenario, setting up a bombing scenario playing a raid scenario post raid sequence wow there's loads of stuff okay so then we get scenario one buffalo wings okay so we know there's brewster buffaloes in this it's got to be brewster buffaloes <laughs> all right so uh u.s and japan into the cauldron so you've got french and germans the old guard french and germans more friend rocket attack soviets and japanese how about that very cool operation pedestal mini campaign so morning midday and evening and then looks like another midday port moresby uh yeah obviously that's american and japanese and then we've got yanks over darwin American Japanese again. All right. And then it looks like this page here is talking about uh, which aircraft counters that you're going to utilize. All right. So we've got campaign sequence of play, sun position, cloud table, talking about drive on Kiev, Operation Barbarossa, talking about Soviet fighters. Raid target damage? Uh -huh. All right, so let's get to the meat and potatoes of this because this is what people are going to want. They are going to want to see the new aircraft that are included in this expansion. So we see we've got Soviets, British. Uh, isn't this Romanian? Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's Italian. Right there. That's Italian. Dual-sided. So you get plenty of info about the aircraft on the back. That's uh, that's actually a, a pretty nice little extra there. You figure GMT could have just said, okay, here you go. Here's the planes. Oh, the aircraft, Cobra, the Hawk. The Nate. Once again. Nice, 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 nice. Wildcat, Warhawk, Hurricane, different variants of the Hurricane. There we go. There's the Brewster Buffalo. <laughs> Not necessarily uh, one of the greatest fighters that the U.S. ever produced. Oh, well, these were popping out. Popping right out here. Yeah, there you go. See? 
That's some good die cutting. And then we've got the counter sheet with the various squadrons. And it is dual sided. Let's give it a second to kind of focus in here. Got some informational markers and counters there. All right. And then this is, I think, maybe this is what was missing. I think it may have been the drive on Kiev map here that was missing from the shipment. Here, I'll kind of move it over a little bit so you can see more of the map. Because I know my mug is occupying that uh, upper left corner there. Get a better look. Kind of bring this up a little bit. And it is only single-sided. So we've got the, it's more, I would say this is more like a play mat kind of here as instead of like, or, you know, play board as opposed to a map. So we've got that. We've got the aircraft counters. We've got the various details about each of the new, I believe it was 16 aircraft that we've got. Got these here. Got the drive on Kiev sheet for the campaign. And then we've got the expansion rule book with all the scenarios and various different rules. And that is what we find with Wing Leader Blitz 1939 through 1942. Designed by Lee Brimcombe Wood. Hopefully I got close on that pronunciation. I don't know. Okay, so let's slide this back on in here. Okay. And seal that up. Okay, so let's flip back over this way. So... Wing Leader Blitz 1939 through 1942 is available now from GMT Games. It does carry an MSRP of $36. Now, I did reveal last week that I'm going to give this copy away. I am actually going to ship it out to one lucky winner in the U.S. You must be in the United States to win. Sorry, international viewers. And I'm going to make this super easy for you to win this copy. So last Wednesday, I did a review of This War of Mine from Galactic Games and 11-Bit Studios, uh, which is actually released through Ares Games. And I had pointed out, hey, I'm going to, going to take a look at this next week and said, hey, all you got to do is comment on that video. Be a subscriber and comment on the video. For this week, same thing. I've got one copy of this. All you need to do is be a subscriber and either comment on this video or last Wednesday's video, which is the This War of Mine review. Easy peasy. I will announce the winner on the 14th, which just so happens to be Valentine's Day. And uh, I will ship this out uh, probably that weekend. I'll head over to uh, the post office and get this out. Next Wednesday, I will have uh, some other Wargaming-related giveaways to announce. It won't be as easy to win as just simply being a subscriber and commenting because um, we're talking about bigger MSRPs on these. Anyway, so you'll want to tune in next week. What I might be doing with that little segment there, I might split that off into a different video too. Because I know uh, there were people who were like, oh, yeah, I really want to see the Wing Leader expansion. Maybe they're not so keen on, you know, watching the rest of the show. It's not something I'm going to do a lot of because it's just a lot of extra work for me. But uh, I think I might just cut that. I mean, I'm going to leave it in this video, obviously enough. But I might separate that off as a, a separate video 
for folks who are just really only you know interested in ch checking out the expansion. All right, so anyway, so I had mentioned earlier, I am going to show you how to play Twilight Struggle. So there is a method to my madness here. So let me switch on over to the other camera and remove this. Ta-da! But what I need to do is I need to hop up here and zoom out a little bit. Because I should have this. Yes, and I knew that these counters would get bumped around a little bit. So let me... Uh, no, that's zooming in, Jeff. That is zooming out. All right, so I do have this camera kind of precariously perched. So I wanted to be careful as I did that. And uh, I do apologize, probably a little bit of a little bit of glare popping up from the different lighting. Let me kind of, uh, let me fix these. These got kind of bumped around a little bit. Doesn't look too bad. Okay, cool. All right, so Twilight Struggle is one of my all-time favorite games. I love this game. I love playing this game. I love introducing this game to people as well. Because on the surface, people think, wow, you know, that, that looks really complex. It looks like a, a pretty, pretty difficult game to play. And it turns out, in reality, it is not. It is not a difficult game to learn how to play. Where the difficulty may come in, or the challenge comes in, is getting to the point where you can play the game well and have a shot at winning. Especially if you're, say, playing the United States early on in the game, or if you are the Soviets, the USSR, later in the game. And I will get to all of that in just a few moments. So the first thing I want to do is we're going to take a bit of a tour around the board, and I will kind of explain, and once again, I don't want to have to jump up and down to try to zoom in and focus on stuff. So uh, it's probably a good idea if you go full screen on this. So let me grab a sip of Diet Pepsi here. It's awfully, awfully dry down here in the duct tape studios. All right, so the premise of Twilight Struggle, it is the Cold War, 1945 through 1989. And it's a seesaw battle. It's a back and forth tug of war over which ideology is going to emerge victorious. Is it going to be the US and its Western allies who believe in democracy or is it going to be the Soviet Union and its satellites and the way of communism so you have two players it's a two-player game and one player is going to represent the united states and the other player is going to represent the ussr and it is all based in history it is a card driven game it's probably one of the best known card driven games out there and not that twilight struggle is the first card driven game to utilize these mechanics uh, Mark Herman, with a lot of his games, especially like Washington's War, he's kind of, I don't want to say he's like the, the granddaddy of card-driven games, but many of his designs helped kind of issue in the whole card-driven, where you can use a card for more than one purpose in a game. So I do know that, yes, my mug is taking up this corner up here, but we're really not missing anything in this area. In fact, I can probably scoot this down just a little bit so that we can kind of show Canada. So if we go around the board, we'll have, you'll see kind of the end of our action round track. Twilight Struggle plays over a maximum of 10 turns. You may not reach all 10 turns. I have actually won Twilight Struggle in the second turn as the Soviets. So it it is variable on when the game will end. The game will never go more than 10 turns. Within each turn, though, you have what's known as an action round. 
And here we can see four, five, six, seven, eight. Of course, obviously, being hidden is one, two, and three. And you will have six action rounds in your first three turns of the game. That's considered the early war. And then after that, you have seven action rounds. It shows an eighth action round almost never happens. And you have this little counter that you're going to place on the action round so you can track who's who's phasing, whose phase is it in the action round? Is it the Soviets or is it the US? Now the Soviets always begin the turn first. So you have the Soviets, flips on over and it shows it's the US action round. Pretty easy enough as you're going along. Soviet player plays a card. Okay, great. Flip it on over. Now it's the US turn. Okay, they've done their card, taken their actions from the card. Boom, just flip it on over. Okay, on to the sixth. The game does, of course, when you're first learning how to play and you don't know all of the cards, yes, it's going to take a little bit of time to go through the turns, but once you have a good feeling for what how the cards work, what some of the cards are, then it moves pretty easily, pretty quickly. Uh, Elliot Miller, my best friend who just about every day, and I joke around, he should advertise. He should be an, ad, I should be charging him as an, ad, you know, as an advertiser. Elliot Miller over at voiceofe.com, my best friend. We play this a lot. In fact, every Gen Con for the past few years, I think about the past four years, we play a Twilight Struggle challenge. So we go and we grab a table in one of the open gaming areas and I always bring my copy of Twilight Struggle or sometimes he brings his and we will play a game and it's sort of like, yes, it's the big, you know, the big matchup for the year. But we will play it more often than that. It's just a thing we do at Gen Con. Don't know why, we just do. Uh, we've done it at Origins too, but it kind of Gen Con is our thing. So anyway, so you've got the action round track. Then you've got your turn track. So here it's showing early war, first three turns, and it tells you right here, six action rounds. Then you go into the mid war, and there are four turns and it says you'll add the mid-war cards to the deck and now you have seven action rounds. And then in the late war, you still have your seven action rounds, but you'll also add in late war cards. And then if you get to the end of turn 10, you will have a final scoring round. And I'll get to the scoring in just a moment. So, the aspect of the game is really effectively that you're trying to control the ideologies of different regions in the world. Are they tilted towards the US? Are they tilted towards the Soviets? And although this kind of looks like a war game, you are not deploying troops. You're not fighting battles. Now, granted, there are wars and things like that that break out. But, and there are coup attempts in the game, which I'll get to, but you're not actually doing any sort of grand strategic actions as far as fighting battles, fighting campaigns, so on and so forth. So as you look around on the board here, let's move further on down and I'm kind of hiding the map key here, which is really super important. But down here on the bottom, and I'm going to push this back up so we have this in view is the victory point track. So the victory point track starts at zero. So it's evenly balanced. No one is in the lead. The Soviets in the US haven't really started to uh, try to influence various parts of the parts of the world, try to, you know, rattle their sabers and so on and so forth. Now the victory point track is pretty easy if either side ever reaches 20, the game immediately ends and it is a victory for that side. And you'll see the victory points swing back and forth, up and down, because 
Say for an example, maybe the Soviets score a couple of victory points because of something on a card. And then later on in that, in that turn, there's a scoring round and the US gets, let's say five points. So you deduct the two, add the three. So as I mentioned, it's uh, kind of seesaws back and forth. Now it is very possible that suddenly you'll see a huge swing in victory points in the game and uh game ends very quickly <laughs> it you know it does happen then down here we've got the defcon status in which the defcon status is anywhere from one to five if the defcon status ever drops down to one it's nuclear war the game is going to end and the player who actually caused the nuclear war not necessarily the player that played the card that dropped the DEFCON status to a one loses. It's, uh, it's a little tricky. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen where nuclear war is triggered and that's how the game ends. And you, you sometimes have to look up some frequently asked questions depending on how the cards played out to find out, okay, so who really is at fault and who should be declared the victor. Although in a nuclear war, really nobody's gonna win, but rather than saying, okay, well, you go to DEFCON 1, it's nuclear war, everybody loses. No, 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 the designers didn't do that. Then you'll have required military operations because all throughout the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviets were always, you know, rattling their sabers. They were always, you know, trying to one-up each other behind the scenes, influencing world events, brush wars, all these different things. The Korean War is a great example. And to kind of uh, continue with the prestige, or I guess maybe we would say dominance of the other countries that were allied with either the U.S. or the USSR, each of these proponents had to kind of satisfy um, generals and other, uh, other world leaders and things like that by saying, oh, you know, we're not weak. We're not weak. So there are various different things within the game that will count as required military operations that actually will tick your U.S. or Soviets down. And the thing is, at the end of the turn, whatever it, the required military operations begin the turn equal to whatever the DEFCON status is. So if your DEFCON status is three, then your required military operations for each side is three. Uh, DEFCON status can be moved because of different cards, things like that. Then moving along, we see a sequence of play down the side here. And it's pretty easy, just tells you, okay, increase DEFCON status, deal your cards, play a headline phase, do your action round, check your military uh, operations status, reveal a held card if you're playing in a tournament mode, which I have never done. Then you're going to flip the China card if it's flipped over here, and you advance the turn marker, and if it's the end of turn 10 you do the final scoring. So continuing around the map, you will see that we see much of the globe broken up into different regions as well as different countries. So here we have South America, Central America, Western Europe, Eastern Europe. Both of these combined are considered Europe. You've got the Middle East, you've got Africa, and then you've got Asia. And then you also have Southeast Asia, which is a sub-region of Asia. And during the 60s-ish period of Twilight Struggle, there's actually a Southeast Asia scoring card, which it's only scored once. So it's kind of the whole, what was going on in Vietnam, Cambodia, all these kind of things. Although it is part of Asia, there is a special 
Southeast Asia scoring card that only takes place once in the game. So anyway, talking about these countries, you'll see that it shows the name of the country, it'll have the country's flag, and then there's a number. You may also see a country and it's bold. It's got a bold kind of purple background to it, whereas the other countries just have kind of uh, a yellowish background to the country name. If it's bold like this, that means it's considered a battleground country. And that's important when it comes to scoring and coup attempts and things like that. I'll get to that in a moment. Then you'll see there's a number and that is kind of historically the stability of that country. How stable was the government in this country? So for an example, you'll see the UK is a five. Well, that means the UK is always, has been really stable. It, it, the UK has always been a staunch ally of the US and of Western policies. Other countries, not so much. So especially when you start looking into parts of Africa, you'll see stabilities of one, stability of two with some countries. And that just means that their governments easily would flip. They would easily flip sides. So one moment you could be saying, well, okay, uh, Nigeria is firmly devoted to Western policies and then a coup takes place. And wow, now they're completely in the pocket of the Soviets. So those things can happen. So you'll, you'll take a look and you'll see that that's really all you're looking at for each of the countries is what is what is this? Is this a battleground? Yes, France is a battleground. That is the sp stability of France. Easy peasy. Uh, next thing you're going to take a look at is that some of these countries to start off, I've basically set this up like you're starting the game. So some countries, so for an example, we've got, we've got Poland doesn't show anything in the Polish box. There's nothing there. So that means, and you'll see that with many of these countries, they're neutral. They have, you know, there's no dog in the fight as far as um, which way are they leaning. Whereas we see Finland early on, there's a little red one. So that means that the Soviet player will actually, excuse me, begin the game with one point of influence. So this is the big aspect of the game. It's all about building up influence in different regions so that you control countries, you control regions, you control battleground countries. And to do so, you're going to be utilizing these various different counters. And we have the Soviet counters and we have the United States counters. So as an example, I'll just kind of lift that up there a little bit. So this is three influence. So you've got where it's got a solid, it's a solid color. You've also got it where it's a white background. And what you're doing with those, that helps to indicate a country if it is controlled or if it just has influence in it. So for an example, we see that for the Americans, and uh, what I did is I actually put some influence into some of the countries because the way it starts off is the Soviets get influence in certain countries and then they have so many points of influence that they can place in Eastern Europe. And then the U.S. will start with influence in various countries and then they have so many influence points that they can free, freely place in other Western European countries. So I've kind of set it up with uh, the U.S. player, the Soviet player have actually placed some influence into various countries. And as you play the game, you'll kind of get a feel, especially if you play it against the same person quite a bit, you kind of get a feel for, you know, where do you want to have your influence? Where do you not want to have your influence when you first start off? The other thing on the map you want to keep an eye on, you'll see there's these connecting lines. So we see connecting lines, they can either be kind of regionally connected or inter-regionally connected. So for an example, we show France and Algeria. 
Well, France and Algeria are not regionally connected, but they are connected sort of politically. And at this point in time, they're connected because France actually pretty much has Algeria as a colony. So that's why we see it's kind of a broken line here, but there is a connection. And these connections are very important because you'll be placing influence into various countries and you cannot, unless you have a card, unless the card tells you you may do that, you can only place influence into a country that you already have influence in or it is somehow adjacent by way of these connecting lines. And the way it sort of kind of, you can sort of look at it as it's kind of like a spider web kind of, you know, spreading out, spreading out. You know, your your uh, ideology is, is being spread throughout that area because the influence is, you know, you're behind the scenes. You know, it's a CIA, it's propaganda, it's all this other stuff going on as far as placing the influence. Other thing that you take a look at on the board is you'll see some really bold lines and they just basically mean that these are adjacent to the superpower. So the USSR has quite a few countries that are considered adjacent to the USSR, whereas the USA has Cuba, Mexico, Canada, and Japan. So Japan's over here, USA's over here, but there is a big connecting line. All right, so that is effectively the map. Now, when you uh, begin to play, you're going to be playing with the early war deck. And of course, these are sleeved. <laughs> they have been sleeved forever because we play this quite a bit. And with these cards, uh, let's pop a few of these out. There we go, okay. With these cards, as with most card driven games you're going to be able to use the card in one of two ways really in this there's actually three ways but I do apologize I keep rubbing my eye because my right contact is bothering me and it's actually kind of making me stuffed up I don't know uh, probably have to swap, swap it out and that stinks because I took a whole week off in fact, more than a week where I was wearing glasses and you had the glare and everything else. And uh, I tell you, it's always something. Okay, so as an example here, we'll take a look and it's the Truman Doctrine. And you see that there's a star up in the, up in the upper left corner and it is a white star and it has number one. So what that means is, and this camera's like way up here, so I'm really holding this up. So that means that is a U.S. event and it is worth one operational point. So a player could use this as one operational point. Now it also shows that it's the Truman Doctrine and then there's a little asterisk. And then if we take a look down at the bottom, it's gonna say if you play this as an event, this card will get discarded because as you're playing through the game, these decks will get reshuffled unless cards get played for events that have an asterisk on it. So then it's going to tell you what does the Truman Doctrine do? So it says remove all USSR influence markers in one uncontrolled co country in Europe. Well, that's a pretty powerful event early on. This is, see, this is early war. It says early war card right up on top. So it may be more beneficial for the U.S. player to play this as the event as opposed to just using it for the one operation point. A card like this, Red Scare slash Purge. We see that it's got a white and red star up here with a four. So this means this is a four operation point card. It can be used by either side. It can be used as a US event 
which basically means it's the purge, or it can be used as a Soviet event where it's the red scare. And what this does, it says all further operation cards played by your opponent this turn are minus one to their value. Interesting thing here is this event can take place more than once in the game. Now we got Vietnam Revolts. This is a Soviet event. We see that it's got that asterisk. So it means that if you play it as the event, it's removed from play. And it's also a two operation point card. So once again, either or you could play it for the two operations points or you play the event that Vietnam revolts. And then we've got an early war card CIA created. It's again, it's just it's uh, a pretty minor card with that one operation point. There's also the China card. And because Chinese government was fairly fickle throughout the Cold War, this card can actually change players. So it begins in the possession of the Soviets. So the Soviets have the China card. Thing is, if you ever use the China card, then you actually hand it over to your opponent. They have to place it face down, meaning they can't use it that turn. And then the next turn, they can flip it back up. So now China is leaning towards them, kind of a back and forth. There's also uh, an optional Chinese Civil War box that's over here. Uh, we've never really, I think we, we did it once. It was, I mean, it was fine. It was just a cool little option, but it you know, really didn't affect the game. So here's the big trick with these events and operations points. Let's say I am the American player and I end up with, uh, where did I put it? Oops. Okay. Just as an example, because you'll start off and you'll have, uh, you'll have seven cards in your uh, first three turns and then eight cards in your next turn. Uh, throughout the rest of the game. So for an example, let's say I'm the US player, we've played a few action rounds and these are the cards I've got left in my hand. And these are all Soviet events. What's interesting with Twilight Struggle is, now you can play these, you can play them for the operations points that are up there in that uh, star up in the corner thing is these events are gonna trigger so these events will take place so for the Soviet player and whoever is the active player so for an example if it's the Soviet player and they play a US event for those operation points then what will happen is you get to decide when does that event take place? Does it take place before you take your actions from the operations points or after? So there are times that you can have your opponent take the event, do the event before you actually perform your actions and then just kind of uh, almost like damage control, use those points as far as kind of negating what they may have done. So that's an example there. It's really important as a player to understand the whole concept of, okay, so, wow, this is an event that uh, it's going to be really damaging for me, but I could really use those points. Yeah, it's kind of, you got to kind of juggle a little bit but there is one out that you will have available to you on every turn and it's the space race and it is this track up here and the whole space race is abstracted in twilight struggle it does play a part in this but very very abstract as each country was trying to be the first to put a man in space, you know, put a satellite up 
So what you can do is you can actually take one of your cards and more likely than not, it's going to be something from your opponent that you don't want to have to play. And you may play it into the space race. And it's going to tell you, all right, how many operations points must that card be to be able to play it into the space race? So early on, you just have to play a two op or more card, and then you're gonna roll a die, and you're gonna roll the die to see. So for an example, success would be on a one to three. So, you know, of course we, we tend to refer to it as burning a card to the space race. All right, well, I'm gonna burn this to the space race. And then you take a look to see, okay, so first would be Earth satellite. You'd roll your die, got a six, so that'd be a failure. So, okay, but still, I got that card out of my hand. Now, if it's an event that has an asterisk on it, remember, it's not gonna leave play. It's just going to go into a discard pile because that event did not trigger. You're just discarding that card. So you're, you're delaying what could possibly be the inevitable. And then, of course, you'll get victory points. So if, say, for an example, the first player to put a satellite in Earth's orbit gets two victory points, then after the slash, it shows, okay, so what does the, the second person get? Well, in this situation, it's one. And you'll see that the victory points kind of skip. They kind of skip a little bit. So next is that you're putting an animal in space. Well, you're not getting victory points for it, but then you suddenly get a special action which says that you may play two space race cards per turn so effectively you could take two cards out of your hand that have opponents events on them that you don't want to trigger and play them into the space race now these bonuses for an example here it's opponent chooses and shows their headline card first once both players would be at this then that negates the ability that you may have gained earlier by being ahead on the space race. So that is one way to avoid having your opponent's events take place just because you want to use those operations points. The other way is that you should usually have one card left in your hand at the end of the turn. So if it's something really devastating to you, that you know that if your opponent gets to play that event, it's not gonna be good. You can just hang on to that card until the next turn. And then of course, you know, then you have an opportunity to possibly put it in the space race. Or there's times where you'll have a card that stays in your hand for a few, few turns because you just don't want your opponent to have an opportunity to play it. There are some other cards that will allow you to um, kind of utilize and an opponent's event card without triggering the event. They're few and far between. So what you'll do is everybody will have their hand of cards. And I might as well put these back together in here. And as I mentioned, to begin the game, you're going to have a hand of seven cards. And this is the early war deck right here. There are three cards that are added to this early war deck. And this is where the meat of your scoring for the game is going to take place. And this is with the scoring cards, the regional scoring cards. So to begin with in the early war, there's only three. You have Europe, the Middle East and Asia. And wow, this contact is really giving me trouble. In fact, let me uh, kind of move off screen here for a sec and blow my nose. I apologize. Uh, hopefully, I think I've got a, another pair of contacts I can pop in uh, later on because it's really, really causing me a hassle here. In fact, you can probably see my eye is watering. Huh. Weird, very weird. Wasn't so bad upstairs. All right. It's just, uh, once again, cause it's kind of dry down here and 
Smokey and Pinky hang out down here, the two cats. So there's, you know, Cat Danner and stuff like that. <laughs> All right, sorry. So anyway, so we've got... See, hey, that's what happens. It's live, right? If this wasn't live, I could just edit it out. We'd be good. All right, so we've got the scoring cards. And the way the scoring will work is you may not hold on to one of these scoring cards at the end of your turn. So if you get a scoring card in your hand of seven cards, or later on when you get your hand of eight cards, it must be played during the turn that you received it. And that is why in the tournament rules that you have to reveal what the card is that you're holding, what, what's still left in your hand, if you have a card, at the end of the turn to prove that you do not have a scoring card because you could cheat. People could easily cheat and say, okay, well, no, I don't have a scoring card. I don't have this scoring card. And it's actually the card that they're keeping because... The thing is, you have to play the scoring card even if you're way behind in that region and you're going to lose, you're going to see your opponent score a bunch of victory points. <laughs> all right, so anyway, so you would have these scoring cards are also mixed in to the early war deck. And I'm not going to actually play through a turn or anything like that. I'm just going to kind of give you an idea. All right. So as let's say I'm the Soviet player, because a lot of times I get stuck playing the Soviet, especially when I'm introducing the game to people. Because a lot of times, you know, they don't, they don't, we're Americans. They don't want to have to play the Soviet Union. Although the Soviet Union has the advantage early on in the game. So as you can see, that as a Soviet player, I'm like, oh, hey, that's not too shabby. I've got five of the seven cards are Soviet events. Now, I may not necessarily play these as Soviet events, but regardless. So to begin, you'll have your cards, and then you're going to choose one of these cards as the headline phase. And the reason why there's a headline phase, it's to make sure that Historical events do take place during a turn because it is possible that you could sit there and just be playing cards for the operations points and no historical events take place. So what you do is you simply will choose a card. You're going to play it face down. Your opponent's going to do the same. They're going to choose a card, play it face down, and then they're going to reveal their um, they're going to reveal their uh, headline phase and whichever, whichever has the highest value goes first in the event of a tie it is um, it's the US player and I apologize you get 8 cards why did I say 7 I don't know you get, uh, you get 8 cards in the first three turns, then you get nine after that because you always have one left over. I was forgetting about the headline phase, but that's uh, that's an important thing. So what can you do with these operation points? Let's say you don't want to, you're not playing an event. Well, you got a handy dandy reference card right here for you. It's going to spell everything out. So... Although the rule book clocks in at about 32 pages, the rules of the game themselves, of them itself, aren't that long. Ten. Everything else is just kind of optional information. An extended example of play, which is a really, really nice example of play. You've got the card histories. And then you've got designer notes. So even though it looks, oh gosh, 32 pages. No, only about 10 pages of rules. And there are illustrations too. So it's not 10 full pages. So once you have a good idea in the rule book, all you need is this really to play. If you have any kind of question what's going on. Because all that's really taking place is you're playing cards and you're deciding, am I playing it? If it's my own event, do I want to play it for the event or do I want to play it for the operations points? And with those operation points, you can do 
a few different things. You can simply add influence. So you could spend, say for an example, I'm spending, I'm gonna use de-Stalinization as a card. I'm the Soviet player. I'm gonna play de-Stalinization, but I'm not gonna play it as the event. I just want the operations points. So that gives me three points. Now I could use those three points to put influence into countries. As I mentioned before, when you're placing influence, you have to make sure that that influence is either going into a country that you already have influence in, or that you can trace a line, you can trace some sort of a relationship to that other country. So I'll give you a perfect example here in Turkey, right? I've got Turkey, if I wanted to place influence into Lebanon, I couldn't do it with influence in Turkey because there's no line. Even though it's right here, there's no line. Now, granted, I have influence in Syria, so I could carry influence over into Lebanon. Now, you can't do a big domino effect because you cannot place influence into a country that you did not have influence adjacent to it at the beginning of that action round. So for an example, if I had three points, and of course you've got all these counters for the different influence values. And then there's some extra counters here as well for some of the events. We don't really ever use these counters for the events, because there's events that'll kind of stay in play for the game or until another card negates it. We just leave the card along the side of the table so we can see, okay, these are active events that are still taking place. Just like for an example, I showed you the, uh, the Red Scare Purge card, which says, hey, for the rest of this turn, your opponent's cards uh, have minus one operation point value to a minimum of one that's all turn long. So we would make sure we have that card sitting out so that the other player can see, hey, don't forget this card is in effect. And then at the end of the turn, it would get discarded. So anyway, so for an example, as I was saying, you can't just suddenly spread the influence all over the place. So I could not sit there and say, okay, well, because I have influence in, uh, let's say, because I have influence in Iraq, I'm going to put influence into Jordan with my three points. So it just, it takes a single point to put influence in to a country that there is no other influence or the other player does not control. So I can say, okay, I'm putting a point of influence into Jordan. I'm putting in a point of influence into the Gulf States. Those are legal moves. I could do that because I have influence here in Iraq. What I couldn't do is I couldn't say, well, now that I've got influence in Jordan, I'm putting influence into Saudi Arabia. No, you can't do that because I did not have influence adjacent to Saudi Arabia to begin that action round. Pretty easy. So placing influence is one of the aspects of the game uh, that you'll do a lot of. Now, if you want to place influence into a country that the opponent already has influence in, as long as that player does not control the country, and to control the country, you must have influence equal to or greater than the stability number. Remember, those were the numbers I was talking about as far as the stability of that government. So, for an example, Italy is a two. The U.S. has two influence in Italy, so that means that is controlled by the United States. East Germany is a three. The Soviet player has three influence in it. They control that country. Now, if you wanted to try to put influence into a country that your opponent controls, then of course, once again, you have to be adjacent as long as it's, unless a card tells you different. Of course, the cards always over uh, they uh, overrule the rule book. But as far as putting influence into the country, you once again, you have to be adjacent to it. 
So as a Soviet player, I couldn't just say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to put some influence in a Panama way over here because the U.S. player has influence. No, I can't because I have, I have nowhere around here. No one's adjacent. But if a, another country is controlled by your opponent, it will cost you two points to place a point of influence in there and it will cost two operations points until they no longer control it. So for an example, I could spend two to put one point of influence into Italy because Yugoslavia is connected by that line. Well, by doing that, that immediately would drop Italy from being controlled by the U.S. to just simply having influence from the U.S., and then I could actually spend just the other point to make it two and two. For an example there, because I would have spent the two points of the three to place my first point of influence. Now the opponent does not control that country any longer. Now any further influence only will cost me one. <clears throat> so you do a lot of the placing influence. Then... You also have coup attempts. And as I had mentioned before, we have the DEFCON status here. We have the required military operations. If you do not perform your required military operations, so for an example, in the first turn, you have five military operations that have to be performed. You're going to get penalized victory point wise. And so for an example, we have coup attempts. And the coup attempt simply is you'll play a card. Let's use another example here. So let's say I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to use this for the Warsaw Pact. I want to use this for a coup attempt. So I would play my coup attempt. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to attempt a coup in Italy. I don't have any influence there, but the other player does have influence in Italy. So I can say, okay, I'm going to try a coup attempt. I'm going to roll one die. And I actually even have like a Soviet die and a U.S. die that I went and bought. So I'm going to roll one die and I'm going to add the number of operations points of the card to that result. So for an example, I would get a four and then I add that, so that's seven, right? Three and four is seven. For the country, what you would do is you multiply the stability number by two. So the stability for Italy against the coup is a four. You're going to add that, so you're looking at that's two. So that's six total. I have a seven. So what I would end up doing is I'm going to remove the influence. So this counts for four five, six, I have a total of seven. That would allow me with this coup attempt to actually place a point of influence into Italy. As I try to grab a one out of here and grab a two by accident. So I would have flipped Italy with that coup. So now suddenly there's been a governmental change in Italy. Now they're no longer all like, yeah, USA, USA. No, now they're like, yeah, USSR. Not controlled by the USSR yet, but there's been a huge shift. And then what's going to happen is whenever there's a coup attempt in a battleground country, remember I had pointed out the purple backing on the country's names the DEFCON is going to drop down by one and your military operations are going to, you're going to count the number of ops points that you had spent. So this is three. So this actually is considered three operation, military operations, because it has a value of three. With the DEFCON status, it's going to tell you, okay, so at DEFCON 4, there are no coup or realignment roles, and I'll talk about realignments in just a sec, in Europe. 
So once this DEFCON hits four, that's it. Okay, no more coup attempts. So now the US player following me up, he can't play a card to try to have another coup take place in Italy for the rest of this turn. In fact, if this DEFCON status doesn't get back up to five, nobody's gonna be able to make coup attempts or realignment attempts. And when I talk a little bit about strategy, I'll kind of talk about the Soviet player and coups. So we've got that, we've got the coups. Then we have what's known as realignment rolls. So realignment rolls are pretty easy, whereas we were playing that one card and we took all three of those points and we placed them into, and of course there's some modifiers for uh, for some of these things. Now, with the coup attempt, no. That's just a straight roll. Your opponent doesn't get to roll a die. But with realignment rolls, you do. So what a realignment roll is, is you're just looking to remove influence from a country as opposed to flipping the government. And what you'll do is you'll play your card and you'll say, okay, I want to do a realignment roll. Uh, I'm going to do a realignment roll and let's do uh, Panama. And let's say, for an example, it was uh, Vietnam Revolts. That was a card I played, but I don't want to play it as, a, an, as a, an event. I want to play that for the operations points. Now, each player is going to be able to roll a die. And once again, all you got to do, take a quick peek, talking about the realignment rolls, and it will tell you, okay, well, this does have modifiers to it. So you'll have modifiers for uh, being a, uh, adjacent to a superpower. You'll have modifiers for having more influence in that country than your opponent. You'll have modifiers for if your opponent or if you or your opponent controls an adjacent country. So for an example, in Panama, no, there's nothing going on. It's just a little bit of US influence in in Panama right now. Now in the early war, you shouldn't be overly concerned about Central America, South America, as well as Africa, because there are no scoring cards introduced into the mix yet. They don't come in until the mid-war deck, which is on the beginning of turn four, that gets shuffled in to your deck. So what each player would do is gonna roll a die and you're gonna compare it. So You'll say, okay, well, the US player got a four. They have more influence, so that's plus one. That's a five. Soviet player got a five. Okay, so it's a wash, so nothing happened. You're not adding any kind of bonus for this. That's just giving you each point you can do a roll. And it doesn't have to always be in the same country. So I could say, well, I'm trying Panama. I'm going to try over here and you can roll your dice. Now, remember, with a realignment roll, you're just removing influence. You're not putting any of your own influence in, you're just removing influence. So for an example, if the Soviets could get the US influence out of Panama, well, now it's gonna be a little more difficult for the US to influence Central America as well as South America because they're gonna have to be able to utilize a card to get influence, of course, eh, when we get into the mid-war and that, there's, you know, different cards telling you can do different stuff in Central and South America. But if not, then they have to start putting influence into Mexico, Cuba, then go to Guatemala. Then, so it's gonna, it would take them a long time to start getting influence into this area. So that's sometimes kind of an opening move that some Soviet players will, will do, maybe on like turn three, turn two, turn three, try to see if they can get the U.S. out of Panama with the realignment role. So as far as uh, when you're playing a card for the ops, so for an example, let's go back to this Warsaw Pact formed. So if I sit there and say, okay, well, I'm playing this for the operations points, the operations points have to be spent on the same thing. I can't sit there and say, okay, well, I'm going to put two influence uh, on the board and then I'm going to try a realignment roll over here. You have to say, okay, now I'm going to use this card and I'm going to use it for realignment rolls. And then you do your realignment rolls. 
Or you can say, okay, I'm going to do this for influence. And then you use it for placing influence. Or you use the card for that coup attempt. That's all that's basically going on. So for the most part, a lot of times the events are more powerful than the actual operations points. But the thing that happens is you'll find that you end up, uh, let's go, uh, where did that US influence come from? Look at that, see, I'm taking stuff away. Um, that you'll find that if you're playing all these events that have the little asterisk there, then those leave the deck. Those are those come out of play. They are not going to be reshuffled back in from the discard deck. And a lot of times, start using up these events and they've got bigger operation point values. You find as you play and you, you have not been able to win, you haven't been able to knock your opponent out of, uh, out of the game earlier than turn 10, you're going to find that you're going to really miss those big operation point cards. So it's a really cool aspect of this game where you're sitting there going, all right, uh, so do I do I use this as a as an event? Do I use it as as operations points? And a lot of times you want to use it as the operations points unless you know that event is going to really be something that you know, kind of uh, is kind of a game changer. I don't I don't mean it's got to be like, wow, this is how I won the game. But it's got to be something that you're like, wow, I can really get my opponent on the ropes by doing this. All right, so you're going to continue doing your actions until you come to, uh, you finish your sixth action round in the first three turns. Then you'll go to the next turn. And once again, all you're going to do is kind of rinse and repeat, getting your hand of cards, playing your headline phase card, and so on. But you're going to have, and I actually mix them into, ah, there we go, there's Europe. You're going to have these scoring cards. And as I mentioned before, if you end up with a scoring card in your hand on a turn, you may not hold this card until the next turn. You don't have to play it immediately. You can wait until, well, this is going to be my last card that I play because I'm trying to trying to either, you know, really get domination in this region, or I'm struggling to at least not get shellacked victory point-wise on this region when it gets scored. And a lot of times, of course, you know, you don't know. Your opponent may have scoring cards you don't know about. And a clever opponent it doesn't just focus only on the region that they're holding a scoring card for. They're, uh, they'll probably spread things out a little bit. And then you're sitting there and all of a sudden it's like, boom, out comes the scoring card. And you're like, whoa, how? I didn't see that coming. You can play a scoring card during the headline phase. Uh, it automatically will happen last. It doesn't matter what the value of the other card would be. Scoring takes place last. So scoring is broken up that you can have presence, you can have domination, or you can have control. Once again, what does that mean? Oh, well, take a look right there. It says scoring summary. So presence basically means that you control at least one country in the region. So for an example, back to this. The U.S. controls Italy. The U.S. controls the U.K. U.S. controls Spain and Portugal. This is all part of Europe. Even though this is Western Europe, it's considered one thing. It's Europe. So, they have presence. They also have domination because they control more battleground. Oh no, I take that back. They have presence because the Soviets have East Germany, which is a battleground. Okay, so, so that would be presence and then it'll even show on the scoring card. Okay, so how many victory points is this going to be worth? So presence for Europe is three domination which means that you control more battleground countries and other countries than your opponent then that's considered domination so that would be worth seven victory points now keep in mind all you need to win the game are 20 if you happen to have control 
which basically means you control all battleground countries in that region as well as one other non-battleground that's considered control and if you ever control Europe at the end of the scoring when you play the scoring card you automatically win and of course to Asia is a little bit different and then even right on the board it'll tell you so Asia presence is worth three domination is worth seven control is worth nine so it is very very possible to hit a turn where your opponent has a couple of scoring cards and they've you know they've got a yeah the halfway decent lead on you let's say for an example the u.s is here at let's say eight they bust out a couple of scoring cards and the regions that they control, boom, that game's over. That that was 14 victory points right there. Huge, huge chunks. So that is how the game can end before the end of 10 turns. And a lot of times when you're first learning how to play the game, you'll see that happen. You'll see Twilight Struggle end in the mid-war, during mid-war turns. Or you may see even an early war. Like I said, I've, there's been times I've won second, third turn of a game. That effectively, in a nutshell, is how you play Twilight Struggle. It is simply a game of you trying to influence various different countries and regions of the world. You're going to score victory points. You're going to play all these different historical events you either play it for the event or for the operations points and these events are like you know playing this game made me sit there and start reading through the um the card descriptions and then when i was like wow i really want to know more about that i'd be jumping on wikipedia the cambridge five yeah you know i've heard about them huh let's look more into this I mean, it's just it's just the, the history behind the game is awesome. It is really, really excellent. And as I mentioned, it's not that difficult to learn how to play. Now, granted, okay, so I was taking some time to talk about different stuff. But really, all, all you need to do, and I've known people who, who swear up and down they can teach Twilight Struggle in like 10 minutes. And I do believe them. Because what are you looking at? Okay, so you're looking at operations value or the event do you play the event is it your event it's your choice operations points or the event if it's the other players event you get the operations point they get the event uh just keep going through the turns in the middle of in the turn four through turn seven you add in the mid-war deck which is bigger than the early war deck as well as the four other regional scoring cards. Now these come into play. So now, and of course you still have Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. So now it's completely global where it's back and forth, seesawing back and forth. So yeah, so, uh, so okay, so you, know, you use them for the operations points. Okay, what do you wanna do? You wanna add influence? You want to try to do a realignment roll, or do you want a coup attempt? Got victory points, you're tracking them back and forth. Some of the cards tell you, hey, play this as an event, you get a couple of victory points, one victory point. There's the Olympics. The Olympics pop up, and whoever played it is considered, you know, they're the host. And if they win, you get a couple of victory points. And it's funny, because we'll play the, whenever the Olympics card gets played, Elliot or I always start doing Dun, 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 dun. Sometimes we just start doing that before we play the card. It's like, oh, here come the Olympics. So like I said, easy peasy, just not difficult to wrap your head around. That be that said, wrapping your head around the rules of Twilight Struggle, like I said, very, very easy. There's frequently asked questions available out there too that can answer some of the eh, there's a couple of little things like i had like i mentioned before that if the defcon hits one it's nuclear war and the player who triggered that war is the loser and, and it's not always the person who played the card that made it happen because sometimes 
you play a card and the other player, you force another player to do something, so on and so forth. So sometimes there is, yeah, I, I think I've run across it once or twice. And I swear I've played Twilight Struggle at least 40, 50 times. So some strategies to keep in mind when you start playing Twilight Struggle. So the US and the Soviets play differently because the game is not completely balanced. So as an example, say 1960, the making of the president, which is a car driven game, has shares some similarities to Twilight Struggle and other car driven games and is an awesome game. There is an evenness throughout. There is no early period in the campaign. Well, Kennedy's got the advantage and Nixon doesn't. And then later it's like, well, Nixon's got the advantage. Kennedy doesn't. Now, it's all pretty even throughout. And it's just, you know, of course, there's luck involved because obviously there's cards and, and stuff like that. In, in uh, 1960, there's no dice, but there are cards. And of course, here in Twilight Struggle, you've got the cards and the dice. So there is that luck. Now, early on in the early war, the Soviets have the advantage. So the Soviets need to push that advantage if they're going to win. The U.S., on the other hand, needs to sit there and they need to kind of counterpunch a little bit. But they got to kind of got to kind of you know, weather the storm. As long as they can weather the storm and they're not down 10, 12 victory points by the time the early war is periods over and you're bringing the mid-war cards in, they should be in pretty good shape. Now, on the flip side of that, if you're the Soviet player, you got to go for the jugular when you have the opportunity. And sometimes it's 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 kind of tricky because every game is going to be a bit different. But sometimes you can kind of get a feeling early in the first couple of turns that, yes, I can I can put this away by maybe turn four or five if I play this right. And so that's when you're like, okay, I want to make sure that, you know, I, I use the event when it, the event's really going to matter. Now I don't necessarily need to, to keep that card around to get reshuffled back into the deck eventually. So the, the Soviet player really has to push their advantage that they've got. Because once the mid-war comes around, then the mid-war is pretty even. That deck of cards is pretty even throughout. So you really don't have that advantage to the Soviets anymore. And then late war, the advantage, of course, obviously, because it's historical, the advantage will now shift to the U.S. So you got to be careful how you approach it. If the U.S. player is still OK, if if you're sitting there around zero victory points because nothing, you know, it hasn't shifted and you're the U.S. player and you're, you're moving into the mid-war, you're looking pretty good. Not to say that things can't change in the blink of an eye, because you can't see massive swings in victory points, especially with because it's a card-driven game. You can play some cards in conjunction and just really, really interesting. You'll, you'll know it when you play it. So that is one piece of advice that I would recommend. Uh, another piece of advice, and I kind of mentioned it a little bit, is that if an event really isn't going to be critical, it really isn't going to just make a big difference in what's going on in the game at the moment, and it's got like an operation point value of three or four, you might want to hang on to that. You may just want to play it for the operations. Don't play it as the event, because as you start using up these like four operation point cards that have the asterisk, and it's like, okay, well, I use the event, that card's out, that's a four operation point card that is never coming back into your hand. So that's something to, to kind of keep in mind as well. I love the, the whole back and forth seesaw of the game itself, but there's also a balancing act as far as how do you approach the game. Uh, another little tip for the Soviet player, the Soviet player always goes first. So what the Soviet player should be doing, as long as the DEF CON level is high enough, is the first round, the Soviet player should be trying a coup attempt someplace. Because you're going to take care of your military operations, 
and you're going to push down the DEFCON. Because remember, DEFCON hits one, it's nuclear war. So if you can keep that DEFCON down around three, two or three, not only are you going to prevent the US player from his own coup attempts, his or her own coup attempts, because remember as the DEFCON goes down, you lose the ability for realignment roles and coup attempts in different regions. So if you're at DEFCON 2, there are no coup attempts or realignment roles in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. And keeping in mind, a coup attempt in any battleground country drops the DEFCON 1. You can really tie up the U.S. player, and what will end up happening is not only will you be, as long as you're, you know, successful coup attempts, but not only will you be um, actually shifting the balance in these countries in your favor, you're also taking care of those military operations that are required every turn. So if you push down the DEFCON to two right off the bat in a turn, because each turn at the beginning of the next turn, you're going to increase the DEFCON by one. There are cards that allow you to move the DEFCON to, to whatever you want it to be. But for the most part, in the beginning of a new turn, you move the DEFCON level up one. If you can continue pushing that DEFCON level where, you know, it's almost at the brink, you tie up the US, they can't do coup attempts, and they start getting penalized every turn because they have not performed the required military operations. See, I mean, there's you can be tricky where, like, uh, I've seen the US player do this too, where um, they'll play around with the DEFCON level if they get the chance to. As a Soviet player, you should never allow the US the opportunity to be controlling that DEFCON. All right, so anyway, so in a nutshell, boy, that was a long show. Uh, yeah, uh, gosh, holy cow, almost two hours? Jeez. So that is how you play Twilight Struggle. It is one of my all-time favorite games. It is, it's obviously in my top five games of all time. I love it, love it, love it. And I'm not alone uh, because if you notice, like on Board Game Geek, it's always right there in the top three to five games. Sometimes it's number one, sometimes it's a little bit lower, but you never see it any lower than like fifth, at least not when I've looked, although it's been a while. All right, so there you have it. That is War Game Wednesday for today. The rest of the week, uh, tomorrow, I am going to review Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition. It's a role-playing game from Gallant Knights Games. And then on Friday, I am going to review Dance of the Fireflies from Backspinnel Games and Ninja Division for Family Friendly Friday. I apologize for this weird contact thing going on. You can probably see my eyes all red and uh, my nose keeps running. All right, so anyway, when you're not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. I will be back tomorrow. And until then, enjoy your hump day. Thank you.